Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Brett Champion and I'm a visualization developer here at Wolfram Research. Today we're going to be talking about gauges. Um, I was asked earlier what I meant by gauges and as the prototypical example, think of the speedometer on your car. Um, so pr possibly you've already seen some snippets of this in some of the other talks. Um, I was surprised about a week ago when Stephen put up a blog post about him and Christopher presenting at the Maker Fair in New York that contained you know, an example of gauges as an upcoming feature. Um, it's like, oh, so he's talking about that now, I guess. Um, so jumping right in, we have six new gauge functions in Mathematica 9, and they fall into sort of two categories. The first are sort of very basic gauges, um, angular gauge, which has a nice circular shape, familiar from speedometers and all kinds of other meters, and then horizontal and vertical linear gauges. And the basic syntax for these is they take a value, and they take a range, and then they take some options. These are very simple creatures, and you would think they would be very simple. And by the time you're done, they have just as many options and complexity as plot um, in different areas, but pretty much the same, um, at least in terms of number of options. We also have three specialty gauges. So we have thermometer gauge, which we'll see if I can get weather temperatures today. And it looks like it's about 55 Fahrenheit outside right now, at least down the road at the airport. Um, and then we have built-in clocks and all kinds of different additional argument structures for this to specify that you want hours and minutes or hours, minutes, seconds and make it update continually and that sort of thing. Um, so far as I know, we're avoiding trademark issues. Um, and then as a more complicated gauge, if I get the scrolling to work, we have bullet gauge. And I'll make this a little bit larger so I can talk about it in a slightly clearer way. So bullet gauge actually takes three things. It takes a sort of primary value, and it takes a reference value, and it takes a range. And the primar primary value is represented by this red bar. The reference is going to be a little line a bit further down or at some other point in the gauge. And the reference value says what it goes from and to. And we introduce a little bit of shading. And we can control where we want shading to happen by extending that list. And possibly I had a bit too many for that to show up, but you can see we have further gradation in there. And the purpose for this is to sort of show where something is relative to a target um, along with various zones of, you know, that may represent this is good, this is bad, you know, stuff's on fire, who knows. Um, and we'll actually see an example of this later on, something very similar to this that is not created using this because this doesn't exist in the version of Mathematica that somebody is using. But once they upgrade to version 9, they absolutely should switch to this and it'll be beautiful. So in addition to showing single values, the gauges can show multiple values. So here we have, um, instead of a single value in the first argument of the gauge function, we've specified a whole little list of them and you get a needle for each of them or, or some sort of marker and they all get unique colors and we're using a different default color scheme than say plot uses um, just because works the gauges work better if they're a little bit brighter um, than plot does and since everybody will want to know this is the new color data 63 whereas plot is using color data one so the gauges are also capable of being dynamic and acting as controls for things. So here we have an angular gauge. 
tied up to a variable x via dynamic. Down below we have um, a slider also tied to x and just a display of what x is inside the style wrapper. Um, and so I can drag the needle on my gauge and the slider and the display update and it works both ways. Um, actually it works all three ways. So if I do x equals 0 0.5 down here. So any way that up x updates, the gauge will follow along with everything else dynamically. So, so now I'm going to talk about sort of the five main components of the gauges. Um, so the first and sort of, well, not necessarily the most obvious one, but one of the most obvious aspects of the gauge is the needle. Um, for, gen for generic purposes, we're referring to this as a marker. Um, and if you say pick angular gauge and ask for the markers, you'll get a big long list of everything. Um, and so we'll take a look at some of them. So we have all kinds of different needle appearances and most of these are adjustable beyond this. Um, so I will take a moment to bring up the chart element schemes palette, which possibly you've seen before and which has been updated for version nine to include a section for gauges. So we'll pick angular gauge and if we say want the shiny hub needle, um, we can change some of the rotation on it, um, different radii to control its appearance, um, tint the little shiny metal part, uh, this sort of thing. And then as usual, we can insert the option directly into our code. I'm sure at some point this will be hooked up to the predictive interface, but I'm sure they also have a long backlog of things that can be hooked up to the predictive interface. So I'll just move that down to the bottom for now. So in addition to needles, we have some other markers. Um, so we have polar marker, which really doesn't look like much. And the reason that it really doesn't look like much is because this isn't its intended use. Its intended use is as a much smaller object that can be positioned relative to the scale. Um, so we have, in addition to having, uh, being able to position markers at the center of our gauge, we have four positions that are relative to the scale. So the first one is sort of centered along the scale. The second one is inside the scale, pointing at it. Um, the third one we see has moved to the outside of the scale. And the fourth one is set to the frame, and so it sort of fills up whatever the natural size of that frame is. And if that isn't enough for you, we also have a third set of positions um, which use markers that are very similar to what you might use for pie chart or sector chart. Um, and so we have our little glass and various shaded versions. And these sort of fill up along the axis from starting from the origin and going all the way around. And so you can either have it fill as a solid bar or we have division center, which this isn't going to show up well, but each of these little sectors is centered on one of our ticks. And we also have division interval where the sectors fill in the gaps between the ticks. And um, it does not have to start at zero. It has to start at the beginning of your scale. So, you know, if your scale goes from you know, minus 100 to 100, it's going to start at minus 100. These are intended to be cumulative representations of something. So that's how th these are designed. So those are the markers. The next thing I want to talk about is the frame. So we have a lot of control over the frame, too. Um, I'm going to reevaluate this just to get different colors. I like those better. Um, so we have sort of a 3D bezel. We have some, um, and I think basically all the others are 
based off of things that were originally developed for pie chart or sector chart. Um, and a actually, you know, that was the init initial idea for some of the gauges was we created all these fun things for pie and sector charts and bar charts. And if we just put an axis on them, then we get gauges. And it ballooned into a much larger project than you know, the initial, well, this will be quick. And, and so also in this case, I've made the, I've used gauge frame size to increase the thickness of the frame so that some of these would show up better. Um, these also work similar things for the various horizontal and vertical gauges. Mainly I like to use angular gauge as my examples because they're roughly square and so they fill up nicely and don't leave lots of white space. Um, but everything is pretty much across the board. And before I go on to faces, we'll go back to the chart element schemes palette and we have a tab here. It switches to selecting all the different faces. I can pick bezel and I can change you know, sort of where my light source is. I can change the relative Sorry, I wanted frame. So this is faces. Now we have frame. Um, same thing. Lots of reuse of technology. Um, and so you can have a lot of control over what this looks like. And as always, insert option will drop it into your code. Now that I've covered everything in that, I can close that out. So faces are basically sort of what's inside the frame. It's the background for the gauge. If you try using background, it will probably do kind of what you want, except that, say for an angular gauge, the background is going to go out to the full corners of the bounding box. Um, the face is only the circular part, say, for an angular gauge. So this brings us to the fourth major component of the gauges, which is the actual scale. Um, so here I'm playing with the scale origin to control whether I want things to start down here with a little gap or if I want them to start over here with a little gap. Um, if I wanted to go from 0 to 100 this way, there's a setting that will do that. Um, here's an example of it going, you know, starting on the left side and going around to the bottom. Um, this one's looping all the way around from 0 to 100 back where it started. Um, in that case, you might need to do a little bit manual labeling of the, you know, starting an endpoint so that it looks nice. The other major feature that we have for the scales is the ability to color different regions along that scale. And this is done via scale uh, ranges. In the simplest case, you specify a range or a list of ranges, and it will pick up the colors from your gauge style. So in this one, say it's sort of the same red as the, my needle. If I say that I want my gauge style to be blue, then my needle changes and that highlight is going to follow to match it. You can also specify via scale range style explicit colors for each of your re ranges. So here we're going to use ye yellow for the range between uh, 60 and 80, orange from 80 to 90, and red from 90 to 100. So you can use this to sort of highlight danger zones in your application or um, target zones or this sort of thing. Um, this is basically the feature that bullet gauge is using to get that gradation behind the entire thing. Um, and the fifth thing that I want to talk about for the gauges is labeling them. Um, so there are several automatic and semi-automatic sorts of things that you can do. If you specify that you want automatic labels, it's going to display numerically what the value is in addition to the marker pointing at the value. If you say unit, it's going to put what the unit of the gauge is. So if you look here, I've actually got quantity wrapped around my input so that it knows that it's in feet. and we have feet here. Um, or you can just use plain text or a picture or whatever you want, and it will put it um, included in your gauge. So 
Cage labels supports all of the usual things that, say, chart labels supports in terms of placing them and styling them and this sort of thing, support for placed. Um, and you can include multiple la uh, labels. So here I'm going to include all three of the ones that I used in the first example. And this is intelligent. It is not going to try and put all three of them I mean, so by default, they're all going into the same place where there's a nice little gap in the gauge where the needle won't hit it um, with the default options. And when I do all three of them, so it's going to position them so that we have the numeric value down here and the unit's going to be up at the top. And the label saying what this gauge is, for example, is um, sort of down in a preferred position. So here I'm going to... Um, do quickly a couple of applications. So I'm going to I have some code here, which is not necessarily interesting, that is going to measure via a scheduled task how much my network traffic changes every second. Um, and then I have a couple of gauges that are ho hooked up to that. And I will bring up a video. And as we play this video, we should be able to see um, the, the red needle is how much traffic I'm receiving. So the video is pushing lots of data into me. And well, I'm not actually sending out very much right now. Um, but so this is hooked up directly to my computer and showing in real time what my network traffic is. Um, this is very similar to what they're doing for sysadmin, except that I'm assured that if I tried to do it with their systems from here, it wouldn't work. So this is my little prototype of it. The other example is the best kind of example um, in that I didn't actually have to write it. Um, so this, this was actually written by Luke, and all I had to do was debug it. Um, <laughs> so this is a little toy animation of a driving game. And so we are, you know, in terms of dashboard, this really is, you know, representing a dashboard of sorts. Um, and so as we are going along, if it will stop scrolling, there we go. We can see the gauges updating sort of semi-randomly with our speed and what our RPM is. I think the fuel is in the wrong units, and so it's ever so slightly above empty. Um, and I'm not sure about the engine temperature either. Um, but it's all you know, updating and nice and useful and kind of fun. And I didn't have to do any of the graphic stuff, so it makes me happy.